Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome again to the IGHS COVID-19 series. Today, we have a spectacular panel, and we will be talking about two things. One, what has been the UCSF response locally in San Francisco and in the state of California around COVID-19? And we will also have the privilege of having uh, Dr. Eric Gusby, who you know has been recently appointed to the president-elect uh, COVID uh, task force. Dr. Dylan Fitchen and myself will be uh, posing some questions to Dr. Eric Gusby about his uh, role in this important task force. So thank you for being here. Um, the format as always is that um, we will have um, a presentation, then we will have some Q&A uh, directed to Dr. Gooseby from Dr. Fitchman and myself, and then we will uh, open for questions from the public. Please post your questions in the Q&A icon. So without further ado, let me um, introduce Dr. Mike Reed, who has been with his team, uh, an absolutely wonderful force in controlling and uh, fighting uh, the pandemic in San Francisco and California. Mike, you have the floor. Great, well, well thank you. Um, Jaime, and, and, and thank you for the introduction. Uh, it's a, a privilege to be with you all today. Um, and I'm going to spend 20 minutes talking about how the Institute for Global Health Sciences and the UCSF Pandemic Initiative for Equity in Action um, has played an important public health role in responding to COVID. Um, but before I do, if I may, I just wanted to pause um, I have great pride for the work that we've done, but I, but I want to recognize the astounding, awful loss of life here in the U.S. 258,000 deaths, 12.5 million cases, and, and, and a surge right now um, in California with, with 18, um, nearly 19,000 deaths. If we could advance to the next slide, Haley. Um, what I would like to do is, is review with you who we are, what is UPIA, the UCSF Pandemic Initiative for Equity in Action, what have we done, how have we done it, and, and where are we headed, and hopefully the reason for including uh, pictures of Nelson Mandela, Emmanuel Kant, Oscar Romero, and Joya Mukherjee will, be, will become apparent over the next uh, 17 minutes. Next slide. So, so it goes without saying that, that COVID-19 represents the, the greatest public health threat of our lifetimes. And although we have much to learn about the pathogen, the epidemic and its consequences, the virus has made one thing clear that for, for any crisis that affects our city or our state, the problem of any of us is the problem of all of us. And in that context, the, the African philosophy of Ubuntu, embraced by Nelson Mandela, makes so much sense. Ubuntu is the, is the beautiful African notion that I am because we are, um, that we are humans through, through the humanity of others. Um, and and that, that notion has been critical to the work of Upaya, a vision for, for collaboration and solidarity in responding to this all-consuming infectious threat. Next slide. So, so what, what is how our work involved? Um, well, we, we, right from the get-go, uh, we have focused the, uh, our, our energies on, on responding to the, 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 the health inequities at the core of, of, of COVID-19. As we've discussed in previous IGHS gram rounds, COVID is a black and brown disease. Communities of color have been 
hit hardest by the pandemic and, and action to resolve the disproportionate impact um, have, have, have been unsuccessful in, in many settings. And so our hope is that, that, that in this moment, we, we can redress some of those root causes um, and, and implement strategies that are uh, responsive to the, the needs of those communities most impacted. Next slide. So who are we? Well, we are um, 88 staff and faculty from across UCSF and, and more than 40 from UCLA. Um, most of our, our, our amazing team are IGHS people, um, uh, and many of whom you already know, um, but we, 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 we work closely with, with partners from the Fielding School uh, at UCLA and, and some amazing collaborators at SFDPH and, and California Department of Public Health. Next slide. And who, who, who's running the show or, or who, who has led this effort? Well, I, I want to sort of recognize and esteem George for his senior leadership. I, everybody has heard George speak over the last few months and his, his, his insights into the pandemic have been critical. But if you can advance the animation for me, Haley, I, I really want to recognize right now the important role of, of colleagues Karen White and Jess Celentano who have been pivotal in, in envisioning and then implementing this incredible public health response. Next slide. So what is it that UPIRE is, involves? Well, in response to the pandemic, um, UPIRE's goal has been to extend the capacity and improve the public health response here in San Francisco and, and California through training, uh, through community partnerships, through innovation and research, and by leveraging data and strategic information to improve the practice of public health in response to COVID-19. Next slide. So how have we done that? Um, well, if you could just go, go back one slide for me, Haley. I, I want to just pause on, on, on this slide and everybody should know who this is. This is Elliot Kip, Kipchoge, the fastest marathon runner on the planet. In Austria last year, he ran 26 miles in, in one hour and 50 59 minutes, which is a mind boggling pace. Well, I ran a marathon last year, I ran the New York Marathon, and, and, and by the time that I'd, I'd crossed the Pulaski Bridge at 30 miles, Elliot Kupchoji had probably finished his marathon. Um, and, and certainly I can't run as fast as, as he, he has, but I think that what, what we've been able to achieve over the last few months in terms of standing up a robust public health response has happened at, at Kipchoge uh, speeds, uh, you know, public health warp speeds. And so if you can advance the next slide, I really just want to highlight some of the things that we've done. So back in March, there were just three of us um, from uh, IGHS, uh, Ali Lynn Dawson, Elizabeth Buttrick and myself, who were seconded to work uh, for, for, you know, with Department of Public Health in standing up a contact tracing program. And then over the course of the next few weeks, um, we, we went from a team of three to four to 60 to where we are right now. And we were invited to help establish a training capability to train contact tracers across California, and then work with funding from, from, from philanthropic sources to, to scale technical assistance programs and, and, and additional curricular interventions. Um, and then more recently, we've partnered with uh, the Indian Health Services to, to implement a contact tracing program with Salesforce to take our curriculum online and, and international. And then with, with, with colleagues in the, uh, the mid-Pacific at the University of Guam, which I'll speak to in a second. And we continue you know, with, with a number of different projects working with uh, San Francisco Department of Public Health and uh, California DPH. Next slide. So this is just a summary of, of, of really some of the, the work that we've done in, 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 in close partnership with colleagues at San Francisco. Uh, we've trained more than 300 contact tracers. Um, our team, um, you know, our SFDPH UCSF team have reached more than 11,000 contacts over the last th four months. We, we've trained over 50 individuals from community-based organizations to do contact tracing. And we've worked with others very closely in the case investigation team, scaling that work as well. Um, many of our core staff at uh, IGHS are also involved with managing this huge workforce, 230 individuals working seven days a week to respond to COVID across San Francisco. And, and now we have individuals that are working in, in, in specific hubs uh, related to schools and, and, and other outbreak related activities. 
I also just want to highlight the, the incredible work of our informatics team from IGHS who have stood up not one, but two information systems to, to respond to COVID-19 and, and have done an incredible job. Next slide. Um, in partnership with California Department of Public Health, um, we, we have um, established an online training platform that has led to over 9,000 learners receiving training on, on contact tracing and case investigation. We've now established an outbreak management training capability as well, and we're about to launch a cultural humility training for the, for the COVID public health workforce across the state. Recognizing that many local health jurisdictions continue to need help to implement their programs, we, 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 we've uh, established um, uh, a set of learning collaboratives where people can learn and knowledge can be rapidly demonstrated around, uh, uh, with regards to best practice for, for public health response. Um, and we, are, um, we support five communities of practice across the state, supporting frontline contact tracers so that they can feel connected and, and understand their role in, in the in the bigger picture. In addition, we have a crack team that, that have been um, deployed to visit local health jurisdictions and to provide um, elbow support to, to the public health teams in, in parts of the state where there are less resources available. Next slide. I, I'm just going to highlight quickly the, the, the really beautiful partnership that we've been able to forge with the University of Guam. Um, uh, uh, some of our team have now been twice to Guam to help train a team of contact tracers. When we arrived the first time, and they were in the mother of all um, uh, COVID tsunamis. Um, completely overwhelmed with, 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 with infection uh, and have done an incredible job of, of taking that, that team that went through the initial training and standing up a, a contact tracing workforce that sits remotely on the University of Guam campus but supports the Department of Public Health there. And, and a testimony to how effective that collaboration has been, the, the governor of Guam just recently gave them a, a, a huge bolus of funds so that they can continue to support the, the contact tracing work on the island. Next slide. So, so what's our collective impact? I, I don't want to dwell on this too much. I think we, we've been really fortunate in terms of um, uh, being able to, to, to successfully respond to funding opportunities. Um, but I think some of the things that make me most proud are, are, the, are the collective impact we've had in reaching individuals across the state and, and the training capabilities that we've been able to leverage to, to capacitate a workforce, many of whom had no pre-existing public health training, uh, including more than 9,000 people going through the Virtual Training Academy and more than 10,000 taking part in our, or, or using our online uh, uh, training curriculum, which you can find on the Salesforce Trailhead app. Um, one thing that's not mentioned on this slide, though, is, is, is the impact that this has had on our workforce. And in a recent survey that we sent out to all of our UPIA team, 100% of people said that they felt successful in their roles. 95% said that they, they would expand the role if they were given the chance. Um, and 95% uh, also said that they, that, that, they were, that they were proud to be part of this team, which I, 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 I feel particularly proud of. Next slide. So how have we done it? Um, well, you know, and, and why do I have a picture of a, a German philosopher on the screen here? Well, Immanuel Kant, as some of you will know, um, is, is thought to have uh, been the, the, the author of the, 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 the concept of epistemic humility. Um, that, 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 that an epistemic humility is that posture of scientific observation that's rooted in the recognition that our knowledge is, is always incomplete and our scientific pronouncements must be built on the recognition that our grasp of the world is, is, is incomplete. And, and I, I, epistemic humility has been at the core of our COVID response over the last few months. We are, we are rigorously evidence-based in, in our response, but we are also keen to assert that we, we, we don't have all the answers. And it's critical that we engage those communities most impacted to understand their lived experience of this epidemic. Moreover, you know, we're continually improving response to the fact that the science has evolved so much over the last few months. Next slide. 
So, so what have we learned? Well, you know, first of all, we, we've learned that contact tracing is not a silver bullet. Um, actually, we have a ton of really rich data that is either in press or, or under review right now. So I'm not going to go into too much of the details around the epidemiology, except for to say that, you know, we, we've been able to characterize really eloquently how we're able to reach contacts within, within 24 hours now. And that's compared to, you know, taking four or five days at the start of the epidemic. Moreover, we're able to reach contacts within less than six days from the time that somebody falls ill with COVID. We know that we need to reduce that time lag between when the case falls ill and when we reach the contact, but it's certainly we're improving. And we're able to characterize the, the proportion of cases that don't have any symptoms at all that are identified through contact tracing. 42% of secondary cases uh, in our program don't have any symptoms when they're identified by, by the contact tracing program. And all of this you know, illustrates the, 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 the epidemiological challenges that we face, but also they underscore the importance of, a, of an expansive response. Just reaching people, just doing the contact tracing in and of itself is, is inadequate unless we're able to support people with the wraparound services so that they can safely isolate or quarantine. And that's been a core component to our training and, and our support to SFDPH is, is emphasizing the importance of that wraparound response, given that COVID disproportionately impacts those communities that have the least agency, the least resources to safely quarantine or isolate without those additional wraparound services. Next slide. I think another thing that we've learned though is that um, <clears throat> Trust comes easier between people with shared language, culture, and experiences. And, 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 and one of our team, Patrick Prado, has really become a champion for, for mining or interrogating our data to demonstrate this very eloquently. And I'm just including one inset here, which is a, a slide that just shows that when a, when a contact tracer, or rather when a contact is reached by a contact tracer who speaks the same language, not only are they more likely to pick up the phone and respond, but we found that when that individual contact tracer reaches them in the evenings or on the weekend, they're also more likely to pick up the phone. And that, that, that analysis has completely informed how we've thought about recruitment and training and developing our resources so that the, the training resources are now in Spanish as well as English, and that we're actively recruiting from those communities that are most impacted to be part of our public health response. I think moreover, this speaks to the need for an inclusive public health response, engaging yeah, those communities most impacted by COVID is, is critical to the success of, of, of the, the overall vision. Next slide. So where are we headed? Um, before residency, um, some of you know I did a, a, a theology degree and I became very enamored with the, the liberation the, theologians of Latin America. And one of my favorite theologians was Oscar Romero. And Oscar Romero is famous for saying that um, there are many things that you can only see that, that, that can only be seen through eyes that have cried. And I think that's true for our team at IGHS. I think many of us have been transformed by this work. We, we've realized, we've seen firsthand the inequities in our city and that informs and transforms how we've wanted to do this work. Um, I think the other thing that, one of the other things that Romero is famous for saying is that we're prophets of a future that is not our own. And, and, and I, I think that's true. We are, we're just getting started. I think there is the possibility that the work that we're doing, the work of UPIA, the transformation of the public health response that is happening right now um, could lead to something very exciting. And I look to Eric and, and the Biden administration to, to leverage the unstoppable momentum of, of, of IGHS right now towards that goal. So, so what are, where are we headed? Um, if you can advance to the next slide. I, I think in the really near term, um, the, the UPIA team have identified three areas that are really equity informed that we, we think should be, and, and we, we, we're funded to address. The first is um, equipping a workforce of contact tracers who can respond to, 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 to school outbreaks. Um, and I just want to highlight the fact that the lack of school opening in San Francisco is an outrageous example of inequity. It's completely unacceptable in my mind that private schools in, in the city of, of San Francisco are, are open, but the public schools aren't. And I feel that painfully as a father of two, two girls here on the slide. Um, 
I think it's it, it's clear that there's also a huge preponderance of, of, of deaths from COVID happening in congregate living situations. Um, and so our training in the next couple of months is really focusing on outbreak management and how can we support local health jurisdictions to respond efficiently um, and effectively to outbreaks in retirement settings, correctional facilities, shelters, etc. So that's a core component of what we're doing between now and the Christmas break. And then thirdly, um, and I've alluded to this already, Really, ready. There's an urgent need to reorientate the COVID public health response. So wherever possible, the work is done by community-based organizations who understand the needs and the challenges and speak the same language as those communities most impacted. And so two of my colleagues, Joy and, and, and Kelly, are really leading the vanguard um, in San Francisco and in partnership with the state to engage community-based organizations in, in the COVID response. And I think that's a real critical priority for us in the near um, term. Next slide. So, so what's our vision for the next 12 months? Where, 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 and, and more generally, you know, how does IGHS re respond to COVID, you know, in, into 2021? Well, it's clear that COVID is, isn't going to go away and, and, and the extraordinary inequities are, are, are still going to be apparent and, and, and we need to respond to them. Uh, our priorities are going to be to continue to sustain and support high quality COVID-19 public health response in California. I think we're really excited to, to consider the, the research implications of that and, and how we document from a scholarly point of view the impact that we've had. But I think there's also a, 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 a very clear sense that we could, you know, leverage some of our lessons learned here in San Francisco towards a global audience, recognizing that, you know, our, our local expertise is what informs our global practice. And, 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 and that's where we feel like we could add value um, on the global stage, thinking through what is what is a global response to future pandemics look like and how could we as a as, as, as a university um, support other entities in terms of pandemic prevention, pandemic detection and response, but always keeping the, the lens of health equity as the as the sort of the, the, the moral compass for what we do. Next slide. I'm, I'm, I, I know I have just a minute left. I, I want to reflect on on the the erudite wisdom of of uh, of Joy Mukherjee. Joy Mukherjee is associate professor of of, uh, of medicine and chief medical officer uh, for Partners in Health in Harvard. And she came and spoke to our contact tracing team on Friday. And we asked, uh, you know, what, what have you learned from your work in Rwanda and the Rwanda response to COVID? And 19 and, and and how does it compare with, with with what we've seen in the us and she 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 left us with three reflections which i think are completely appropriate for me to share with the institute for global health sciences first is the, the importance of leadership and and i think we we have to name and respond to the fact that the the, the us has failed to lead in this moment uh, our, our current administration has embraced that the, the the politics of death um, and we've let people of color die from COVID and that's unacceptable. Um, and that's not happening in other parts of the world. Uh, and, and it was never acceptable for our government to embrace the Barrington Declaration. I know that's something Jaime has spoken strongly about. The other thing that, that Joya mentioned is that, is that health systems matter and systems of care um, matter. And, and, and let's be honest, the system of health, the health system in the US is, is currently really shitty. Um, we don't have a healthcare system, not like uh, other parts of the world. Um, we just have like a, a, a bunch of like expensive hospitals, uh, systems that aren't integrated and connected. And, and I think we have to respond to that um, and, and, and engage community-based organizations in rethinking what a public health response looks like. And, and not only is that epidemiologically important, but it's also morally important to create a sense of social cohesion. And I look to, to Eric and his role on the, on the transition team to inform that discussion. And then finally, Joy highlights the importance of equity. The equity demands disproportionate expenditure among the most vulnerable. And that's true for our work here in the US, but also globally. And I think as we, as we pivot to a global setting, I think that means that we have to rethink what our global health praxis looks like so that it is anti Premises, so that it's anti-colonial and anti-racist. It, it means that IGHS has to become more diverse and, 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 and we need to respond in a way that brings authenticity to, to the work that we do. Next slide. So I'll end there. Um, I want to just say, say thank you. Uh, I, I want to leave you with an upbeat picture, which is me at the end of the New York Marathon. I did finish um, and, and I, I, I want to sort of urge us all that the 
maybe the end is not quite in sight, but, but we're in the, the second half of this marathon and we will win. <laughs> we will complete the finish line and, and, and we'll get to the start of the next starting line soon thereafter. Um, it has been a huge privilege to be part of this work and I hand over to you, Jaime. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mike. I really like the, the marathon metaphor. Um, we in global health are not in a 100 meter race, we are in a marathon. I, I so much appreciate not only your talent, Mike, but the passion and the hard work you have put into uh, leading this initiative. Um, I think the impact uh, in public health has been tremendous. And uh, the data shows the proactive, aggressive, and early response from the city uh, to the uh, epidemic locally. Um, may I invite uh, Eric Goosby and Nilan Fitcham to uh, present themselves here, um, show themselves, uh, I meant. Um, so if people have questions for uh, Dr. Michael Reed, please post them in the Q&A. I know we have uh, received some uh, regarding uh, how to volunteer. And Mike, hopefully you will be able to, to get uh, those uh, later. Um, Dr. Neelan Fitcham and myself, uh, we'll be asking some questions to that, Dr. Eddie Goosby and invite him to reflect on uh, the response so far and what are the prospects uh, in the new administration. Uh, uh, Dr. Fitcham, you have the floor if you want to go first. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jaime. Well, I have the easiest job here, which is to ask questions and put Eric on the spot. So um, I, I hope I won't put you on the spot too much, Eric. I know you're just starting as a member of this task force. But I guess just to give us a flavor of, of what's been happening so far, what is the role of this task force and how is it going to relate to the CDC, the NIH, and the other agencies and also transition groups that are working in the Biden administration. Thanks, Neilan. It's great to uh, participate in this. Jaime, uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak to uh, our uh, extended family here. So it, it's, uh, it's wonderful to do that. I just wanted to acknowledge um, the work that uh, Mike just presented as an example of, um, of seeing uh, a problem and responding to it. And the beauty of the UC San Francisco as an institution and as a part of the community, uh, this is what it's about uh, to me. It's not about uh, writing about or studying public health only. It's also about engaging in public health when it's right in front of you. And this institution, UC San Francisco, has a long history of being relevant uh, and uh, sticking to it, not just uh, putting a speech out, uh, but actually uh, putting um, uh, a commitment that is durable out. And uh, I wanna tell you how proud I am to be part of this institution in that light. And Mike reflected all of that in his, in his talk. So I just wanted to acknowledge it. Um, the uh, transition process has been difficult because of the Trump administration's refusal to uh, engage on any level in discussion, in data movement, in uh, anticipating um, uh, kind of briefings or uh, introductions in the private sector that may play out through this implementation period. Uh, I think that um, we literally only had what was available in the public uh, databases. So nothing that you can't get yourself. Uh, and it put us in a disadvantage. Uh, for weeks now, uh, really uh, for about um, the middle of October, the transition team uh, that 
uh, President-elect Biden and Harris have put up uh, started working uh, by agencies, creating a working group uh, for really every agency of interest. Uh, there were about 27 areas that created working groups. Those working groups come up with issues, concerns, problems that um, align or do not align with the Biden-Harris uh, kind of vision of, of uh, their platform uh, and allowed for a dialogue to start. The Transition Advisory Group on COVID is positioned to listen to the COVID-related recommendations across the board from the medical strengthening response to kind of the psychosocial uh, enabling wraparound services that are so desperately needed, including uh, uh, the uh, bailout uh, discussions that are going on in Congress and have been re rekindled in the last 12 hours or so uh, for a relief package. Uh, that dialogue then goes back to the transition team leadership for uh, a decision on whether or not they'll incorporate it in, for lack of another term, a platform moving forward. Um, I would say, uh, just got off a series of calls this morning that are trying to uh, pivot into uh, receiving briefing books from every agency uh, and going through them, prioritizing uh, kind of content, uh, but mostly looking to prioritize uh, what uh, president-elect, uh, vice president-elect uh, should be focusing on in their first 100 to 200 days. Um, in terms of my particular uh, engagement, it uh, is with COVID, and that's one kind of body of, of information that uh, I'm uh, uh, getting access to. The other body is global programming and reorganization uh, in global programs. So those are the two arenas that I'm getting a deep dive in. Very interesting. Thank you. Um, well, you know, as uh, Dr. Reed just mentioned, and I think he spoke to this very eloquently, that this pandemic has revealed the disparities uh, and inequities in access to healthcare, really in many, many very wealthy countries. And, and poorer countries seem to have done somewhat better in this than, than other, than the wealthy countries. Now, to what extent is it going to be your remit to really look at these glaring disparities, which have been pointed out by COVID, but of course, don't just stop at COVID. Yeah, that's a great question, Neelam. Um, uh, the disparities are, are a red flag to understand and observe the topography uh, and to direct our response to those areas most in need. Uh, so understanding uh, the, um, uh, how, uh, how uh, essential services uh, disproportionately employs um, individuals who are black and brown and in people facing jobs that do not allow for uh, a, um, uh, you know, getting into a virtual uh, work reality. Uh, and as a result, come in front of repeated exposures that they then bring back to their families, many of which are uh, in uh, situations where there are uh, of uh, age groups that span uh, the spectrum from young to old, uh, in proximity uh, for long periods of time that are fixed without the option of spacing, et cetera. Uh, that has shown itself in more seroconversions, more emergency room visits, more admissions to inpatient wards and more transfers to uh, ICU units um, and uh, intubations when you also factor in the comorbidities that run with those same populations. So Mike was correct in saying um, that it's a black and brown uh, uh, out, uh, outcome in most of the United States disproportionately to population. And this is true for any disease you can name. So uh, I think um, once again, uh, we see a repeating message that it continues to be ignored. 
And I think uh, that our challenge is to allow for a convergence of the Affordable Care Act uh, and the spectrum of uh, engagement that that act created in terms of uh, uh, creating and delivering and strengthening health care to uh, vulnerable populations. Uh, and uh, the COVID um, uh, immediate threat from uh, the COVID uh, lack of response and how that plays out disproportionately in different populations in the same city. Uh, and I believe uh, our uh, intent is to strengthen the response, but we will be clearly looking at disparities to guide us. Great, great. And I'm glad you mentioned the whole issue of the Affordable Care Act because of course one of the reasons for the disparities is, is very large differences in access to healthcare services among different groups and particularly in the US when we haven't yet achieved universal health care. And I know that the Biden plan is to really strengthen the Affordable Care Act and bring in a public option and expand coverage. But given the realities of Congress, that may take some time. So are there other things that you think your group or the Biden administration should be looking at to make sure that those people who are not covered by adequate health care are getting free care, at least for COVID, because that's not uniformly happening in many of our states. Yes, you're, you're quite right, it's not. Uh, and I think uh, trying to use uh, the last eight months of COVID and responding to COVID uh, as uh, the um, example of the disparities in issues of access and retention that, as Mike alluded to, uh, um, describe our healthcare system. Uh, our um, uh, frustration in the first outbreaks, in the first few weeks of the COVID outbreak in San Francisco and the six counties that come to the Bay in the Bay Area uh, around uh, trying to engage in a dialogue with third-party payers and insurance companies around the need to uh, scale up testing and their uh, initial perception that they have nothing to do with that, quote, public response uh, and is not part of kind of the healthcare package uh, that they uh, expect themselves to deliver to people who pay them uh, a monthly premium. Uh, and it took a month before they talked to their lawyers enough to, to realize that they did have uh, a responsibility here, although be it undefined, and um, then took another couple of months to discuss what contributions they could make to the public component of the response, specifically uh, scaling up the testing effort. Uh, so that happened in every major city across the United States and highlights the fact that we really do not have a comprehensive uh, delivery system. We have a series of, uh, of, of islands of excellence that uh, care for uh, the people under their umbrella, but do not see a charge to have a public, uh, an agenda for the public health of the community. And they, I would say, most now realize that's an error and they need to engage this. But uh, the COVID brought that out in a big way. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I just wonder in these new packages whether there's going to be specific funding from the federal government to provide access or to buy access for people who don't have it uh, right now. Well, um, the intention would be to use the disparity to define who's eligible for the resources. So put out requests for proposals that are available to municipalities and community-based organizations, so not just to governments, but to both, that could um, uh, present to uh, the federal government, in this instance, a argument for how uh, they would be able to fill that hole. And um, so uh, uh, I believe a, uh, an RFP grant process could be a very strong arm of moving the resources to those areas that right now are not covered. Uh, it's difficult to get um, 
uh, kind of for-profit entities to move to areas where it's just going to increase utilization and drop their uh, profit margin. So yeah. we've got to figure out how to, how to make that uh, coverage uh, an expectation of everybody and not just the departments of health or the county departments of health uh, without the help of the private sector. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, I, and I'm glad you brought up the private sector um, because your task force particularly doesn't have any private sector representation on it. Um, and, I, and I also, just to, to look at a broader view, I heard David Navarro talking yesterday on Hard Talk about the real importance of not using lockdowns um, because of their economic and, and mental health uh, impact on countries to manage this. Um, pandemic. And so the public health policy and economic policy really need to dovetail if we're going to manage it effectively. Um, and that, of course, involves the private sector. It also involves economists. And I'm wondering to what extent your task force is working with those groups to develop this cohesive strategy for the United States. Yeah, Neil, and that's, that's, that's a really um, important point. Um, the um, the understanding those nuances is critical for the long term fix, without a doubt. Uh, I think that the uh, transition task force is focusing on, I would say, more emergent, uh, urgent aspects of strengthening the response right now. Uh, the longer term fixes uh, are so kind of structural in that. They get, they get back to things like living wage and health insurance and how about the areas covered, but how about the spots between the areas covered? The whole um, disconnect of rural health, that's been there since I was a medical student, i.e. the maldistribution of providers. We've not fixed that. And, um, and we continue to see the same disparities in outcomes for hypertension, diabetes, and coronary artery disease and COVID, just, just, you know, just like always. So to, to the older folks, this is just a, a recurrence of something that we've seen our whole career. But I believe that uh, President-elect Biden is completely sophisticated because of his intimacy with the Affordable Care Act and and get and winning that battle he was right in the middle of that with pelosi and um and i think uh, has a sophisticated understanding of kind of maldistribution and uh kind of the narrative around disparities so there's not a convincing that's going to have to occur it's really getting as you say the uh kind of academic talent matched with the implementation uh talent that's in a given geography to try to think through this. But the societal structures, I don't know what to do in terms of, you know, raising the minimum wage to $27 an hour is what they think you should make in San Francisco to, to be able to afford a one bedroom apartment. I mean, those kinds of realities go nowhere in, in trying to come up with a solution. But I believe uh, the Biden administration will be uh, open and focused on that aspect of, uh, of the problem. Fantastic, fantastic. Now, I have actually taken a lot of time, and I know Dr. Svoboda has some questions as well, so maybe I can turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Neelam. Um, actually, I was going to ask uh, Mike Reed if he can come up alive in the screen, because there are questions for him coming from the public, uh, and for you, Eric, as well. Okay. Um, so um, why don't we make this an open panel? Um, Mike, uh, just to alert you, there, there have been two questions regarding how to volunteer in your group. I know you have got plenty of those questions in the past, so you might want to reflect on that later. Um, there's another one that came now in the Q&A from Luke. Uh, Strand about uh, what is the role of changing the conceptualization of public health um, to include economic and social policy so that it supports the equity that uh, UPAIA team is seeking to promote. Uh, so you might want to reflect on that question for a second while I pose this other one to Eric Goosby who question that came from 
Ben Plumbly. Um, and the question is, what engagement in the transition is the transition team having with the Department of Interior? We have seen that uh, territories and reservations have been disproportionately affected by COVID and has extremely poor support from federal authorities. Um, they also recognize the work uh, that the team is doing in, in one. So, Mike, do you want to go first, please? Sure. Well, thank, thanks, Dr. Sternad, for the question. Um, you know, I think that w what we're seeing in San Francisco as, as elsewhere is that, you know, unless you can really support people m meeting their economic as, as well as physical needs to isolate or quarantine, then it, it, it's unrealistic to expect them to stay at home, particularly it, you know, given the fact that those communities most impacted are the ones that are often marginally housed, or financially insecure. So I absolutely think this is the moment to rethink how we deliver public health in such a way that you know it supports people's all of their needs in, in, in a, and, and, and institutes a welfare infrastructure you know Eric um, was pivotal in, in standing up the Ryan White Act which was a, a radical rethink on how we deliver care for people living with HIV uh, uh, quite a few years ago if you ask me now is the time for a new Ryan White Act that speaks to the need to provide the, the welfare infrastructure to support those communities that are most impacted and, and that can look like all sorts of different things but I think it means you know providing health insurance for undocumented people providing people with a living wage when they have to isolate or quarantine and face Failure to do those things will have profound epidemiological consequences, and such that the the, the economic dividend for investing is a no-brainer in my mind. But uh, as I say, I think this is the, this is a topic that our, er, Eric has much more insight in than I do. I um I I hear you with with that. I I think um. It, it's the fight that I believe is the longer haul, but definitely uh, relevant to the here and now moment we're in. Uh, and I think uh, being uh, like um, uh, um, like the uh, you know uh, you know your quote from um, the Archbishop Romero's uh, quote in El Salvador. Uh, he was a person who spoke to. Uh, the inability of those without a voice to uh, engage uh, the power base uh, in the most beautiful way. And it's, it's interesting to me that you, you, you used him as an example. Um, and uh, I think really reflects um, the uh, idea that uh, we, uh, those of us in academia and professions that are given this glimpse of the human condition that is unique, uh, we need to make sure that we transmit our understanding of the burden of the morbidity that, that diseases uh, uh, inflict on our patients and their families uh, is conveyed accurately to politicians to understand the importance of these enabling surrounding um, uh, kind of the social determinants of health are critical to focus on in the long term, but hard to get a politician's interest on in the short term, let alone a budget thrown at it. So it's a difficult struggle, but I believe it's the profession, the medical profession, who's in the best position to understand those relationships and make that argument. Any questions are coming from the public. I will ask uh, Neelam to help me also in sorting out so many questions. Uh, in the Q&A. There's um, one uh, that uh, I also wanted to ask you, Eric, and uh, that is also coming from the public, um, related to, to vaccines. So this is a personal comment. I'm so delighted of the good news. The first great news is that the Trump White House is going out. And the second good news is that uh, uh, efficacious and safe um, vaccines are coming. Now, how do we um, ensure that uh, the Biden-Harris administration um, 
goes back to the international order in uh, global health, returning to WHO, hopefully also signing on for COVAX and contributing to an uh, equal allocation of vaccines in low and middle income countries. What are your thoughts around that? Well, uh, I can hear how you feel just in the way you asked that question. Uh, you know, for a country that has 330 million people and makes up 27% of the global GNP, uh, we have an ethical obligation to be part of the response. And that, that is real, okay? Not kind of theoretical or hypothetical. In, in, and I, I, I'm not speaking for um, the Biden administration by any means here, but I do know uh, the nature of the man and his commitment over the last 35, 40 years has been very sensitive to those issues. Kind of regardless of the specific issue, those things come forward. Uh, and I think that um, we are in a moment where, um, uh, where a commitment to multilateral, being a global citizen, uh, uh, people are very um, in need of the role the United States historically has played as being the other entity in the room in bilateral discussions. So two countries get together over a conflict, health or otherwise. Um, the United States was the country that was asked to also be in the room, even though they didn't have anything invested in the outcome specifically. It was to witness and be there in a way that they that really has not been picked up by any other country. So uh, uh, in, in this discussion on the transition team, much of our time has been in reaching out to multilateral organizations because we could talk to them because they weren't part of the Trump administration in transition. And the eagerness in kind of multilateral uh, uh, WHO, UN agencies, as well as Global Fund uh, in particular, uh, there's a high level of come back to uh, help us work through this COVID moment. The threat to HIV, TB, and malaria in the Global Fund is real. We can quantitatively now see drops in outcomes that had been sustained for years with the introduction uh, and a shift in attention from the country to COVID, to the COVID response. And protecting that is going to be critical. Jaime, you men mentioned COVAX. The Gates Foundation has put a huge uh, amount of support in that. The United States is not part of that, as you alluded to. And without the United States being part of that, it's not going to work. So uh, right now, um, uh, the Biden transition team understands that challenge and are engaged in it. So I'm, I'm kind of optimistic that uh, every issue that you would kind of think should be on the table for discussion uh, is there as we convene. So that's a good thing. Thank you. And uh, Mike, feel free to chime in anytime you want. Uh, Nilam, you might want to select one of the questions from the public now. You're in mute. Sorry. There's a question about the um, contact tracing, and I'll, I'll add to that testing and contact tracing capability or lack of it. And we've, we've heard from Mike about how they're doing an excellent job here in San Francisco and certainly local areas. There are some local centers of excellence in doing, um, doing testing and contact tracing, but we really don't have a national response to this. And I've heard now lots of stories about people waiting four hours to be tested and no contact tracing available. And I know that the countries that have done exceptionally well in handling this pandemic have really, really strong testing and contact tracing. So to what extent do we see the federal government taking a role in setting out some national strategy for this and a national plan? and also a funded plan. Mike, do you want to take that one? I don't know the answer. I, I mean, I, I, I think it, there's, a, there's a very compelling 
imperative for, for federal funding to support you know, community-based organizations to do contact tracing. And certainly, you know, there are groups that, that are lobbying for that. And I think that could provide a really exciting opportunity for community-based organizations to play a more substantial role in, in public health service delivery moving forward. But as, as to whether that's a priority for the next administration, that would be a, a question for Eric. But I certainly think there's, there's a good reason why, we, why, why there should be. Yeah, there, uh, there, there is. It's being um, uh, discussed aggressively. A uh, you know increasing significantly. The the discussion is how much uh, to increase testing sites, uh, turnaround times, uh, making home testing a reality. Uh, analysis of um, basketball and football team bubbles that have been created. It looks like two times a week in testing after about three weeks enables the team to keep pretty sterile uh, and not and not have the flares that they were having regularly before. Uh, and we're taking note of that and trying to model out what might uh, be a smarter approach to deal with the issue of quarantining people for a 14 day period uh, to shorten that uh, with the concomitant use of testing. All of those are being quantitated and looked at for rollouts that would uh, have a real eye for uh, targeting um, communities that show the largest disparities. Uh, the other issue that I think is inherent in that is with three or four uh, effective vaccines coming out, uh, a lot of the questioning that we're getting from reporters has been, which one, you know, are patients, are people going to want you know, prefer one vaccine over another. And we really need to figure out how to message this, but uh, people should take whatever vaccine gets to their arm first. I mean, that's, that's really how they should do it. Uh, and we need to make that part of the communication um, message that, you know, you're, you're dealing with highly effective vaccines. There's really no reason other than your idiosyncratic, your, your, if you have idiosyncratic reasons why you shouldn't receive it uh and allergies as such but uh so we're, we're thinking about that the problem is uh i've never seen a new drug or a vaccine not go to the people who can pay for it first and all of the discussion that we've had to date and i've been involved in half of it uh does not convince me that there is traction to access the vaccines let alone get the system standing to put it in the arm and I'm really concerned that um, we're giving a lot of lip service uh, to something that we will not be able to deliver on. Thank you. We have four minutes left. Uh, this is a question for both uh, Mike and Eric, uh, in whatever order you want. Um, just as the HIV AIDS uh, response in San Francisco became a model for other cities and frankly to the rest of the world do you think that the san francisco response to COVID 19 might become a model for other cities and places around the world i'll let mike mike take a stab at that because i'm interested in what you'll have to say um th thanks Jaime. Uh, you know with, with, with recognition of the fact that I think there, there are many other places in the world doing a better job than anywhere in the US, I'm hesitant to say that we, we should be you know, promoting ourselves as, as experts on this. I mean, it, you know, from a global health point of view, I think now is the moment for us to pivot to East Asia. What can we learn from Taiwan, from Singapore and, and these countries? And, and how have they responded to pandemics more generally? And how does that inform pandemic response you know, moving forward? Forward. But that said, I, I, I am tremendously proud of the work that we have done in response to, to COVID in San Francisco. And I think that, you know, a couple of things that just are, are important to recognize. This was an all of society response. We have, we have 90 librarians who are doing contact tracing. They are equity informed, they are motivated, they love this work. And that, that, that I think is just a beautiful example of how an all of San Francisco response has been effective. And then I think the other thing that I just would like to highlight is, is, the, is the work of the professionals of the Institute for Global Health Sciences here at UCSF. This is a team of people who, who know how to implement programs at scale, do it rapidly and leverage data 
effectively to improve um, health systems. And I think there's a, there is something there that we, you know, a model there for, for what we have done at IGHS that I think could and should inform how other um, cities and municipalities across the US um, respond to COVID moving forward. Yep, totally agree. Eric, one minute response. Um, I, I would echo uh, Mike's um, humility there around, uh, I have been humbled by the Southeast Asian effectiveness. Uh, I, I, there are a lot of reasons that there are differences there, but the override, overriding uh, success is hard to argue uh, that we know more. Uh, also, the interesting role that countries without um, a, you know, uh, large transportation hubs have very different uh, trajectories of outbreak than than we saw in places where there was a lot of movement. Uh, but I think there are lessons that uh, the San Francisco experience has defined, as well as in other in other areas that need to be uh, put together in uh, kind of a best practice way. But the in, the the real need, as Neelam alluded to, is a, a lack of a standard. Uh, on every level, you name the area, uh, has created uh, 50 plus versions of a reaction which have a procurement distribution system uh, associated with that, that has created unnecessary chaos and conflict that has not diminished over time. And I think the need to agree to standards of care uh, that uh, inform state and city uh, um, behaviors uh, will make it a whole lot better and allow us to harmonize and minimize a lot of duplication. Right now, it's it's crazier than I thought. Well, um, I can only say this has been a great panel. I'm so proud to have uh, the Institute for Global Health Sciences at UCSF, uh, people of the caliber of uh, Professor Eric Goosby, Professor Neelan Fitcham, and uh, Professor Mike Reed. Um, I'm, I'm really proud and uh, grateful for the hard work you're doing. And I think this uh, might require an update conversation, say a month from now, because uh, this is a very rapidly moving target. My thanks to you and to everyone who has been joining uh, this webinar. Stay safe and happy Thanksgiving to you all. Happy Thanksgiving.